Ethereum is about to undergo the biggest network upgrade in its entire history, the Ethereum 2.0 merge in just a few short months. So we just got a new target date for the ETH 2.0 merge. We're going to talk about in this video. But most importantly, you know, there's been a ton of downward price action on the entire crypto market this entire year, but things are starting to change and ETH is actually starting to wake up, particularly over the long term and why you need to understand this before everybody else. I'm going to talk about that in this video today as a blockchain developer who works the Ethereum protocol on a daily basis. So if you're new around here, hey, I'm Gregory and on this channel, I turn you into a blockchain master. So if that's something that you're interested in, then smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to this channel. And if you want to learn how to master blockchain step by step start to finish, then head on over to dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp to get started today. All right, so let's jump into this. So let's talk about the Ethereum 2.0 merge and how this is good for the price of ETH, especially in the long term. So, you know, let's first start off with what is the Ethereum 2.0 merge? If you're using Ethereum right now, let's say you're sending tokens around, you're using an application with MetaMask, then you're using the original version of Ethereum that runs with proof of work mining, okay? But Ethereum is switching to proof of stake. And there's this new blockchain that's actually running proof of stake that nobody can really use yet. And whenever that upgrades goes live, they're going to merge this new blockchain back into one that everybody's using now, hence the the merge. And whenever that happens, you know, proof of stake is going to get turned on for everybody. It's going to become a negative issuance asset or deflationary asset. And it's also going to become yield bearing because you're going to be able to natively stake it on the network. And that's really huge. And we have a confirmation for the merge date of September 19th. All right, that is the target date that was proposed by the latest Ethereum core developers call. Now, this could be subject to change, but this is the first time we've had a real advertised day for the merge, and this is a huge deal. So ever since this news hit the scene, you know, we started to see ETH and the rest of the crypto markets, you know, really wake up. You know, the price of ETH has increased, increased significantly off the lows. And by the time I published this video, you know, things might have already corrected. But the important thing to understand is, you know, ETH has broken out of a, a range that was in for a very long time, and the merge has a lot to do with that. So let's talk about how it's going to impact the price of Ether, the asset itself. So, you know, as always, there's going to be lots of people who are trying to trade this, where they're, you know, trying to buy ETH ahead of the merge, you know, anticipating something to happen to the price either before it or even after it, okay? So there's going to be a lot of people who are here for short-term mindset of like buy the rumor, sell the news, that can buy a big bag of ETH, maybe accumulate it up until the merge date of September 19th, and then maybe right before try to sell it because they think that that's the perfect time to exit the trade. But that's not really what I want to talk about in this video. That very well can happen, you know, the ETH merge trade. But what I'm more interested in is the long-term price impact on the price of ETH. What I'm more interested in is actually the long-term price impact that's going to happen from the merge. Because mathematically speaking, this will affect ETH's price with a few assumptions. And let's talk about those right now. So the first thing you have to understand is what affects cryptocurrency prices in the first place. Because they don't really work like stocks. They don't really work like many other assets in terms of their valuation models. But fundamentally speaking, they do work like everything else, which is the price is a function of the supply and the demand, okay? So basically, in order for a price to increase, you have to have a greater demand than the supply. So that also has an additional assumption behind it that the supply is somewhat predictable. And in this case, you know, with a cryptocurrency like ETH, for example, you know, it, it's digitally scarce. Mathematically, cryptographically, we know exactly how much Ether is out there and how much new ETH is created every single day because it's programmed in the blockchain itself. And so right now, you know, a small amount of new ETH is hitting the market every single day that's created by the blockchain. And assuming that, you know, the demand for ETH just grows at least slowly over time, that means that, you know, ETH is going to increase in price as it is now. But post-merge, there's actually going to be less ETH on the market every single day. But post-merge, there's going to be less ETH on the market when you measure that out on a monthly and yearly timeline. And assuming that, you know, there's at least just the same amount of network activity and it doesn't drop, and that translates to demand for ETH the asset itself, that's going to have an impact on the pact of That's going to have an impact on the price of Ether and a lot over the long term. So let me let me break that down. So if you spent any time in the crypto space, you've probably heard of the Bitcoin halving, where every four years, the Bitcoin blockchain reduces the amount of Bitcoin that hits the market every single day by half. So for example, you know, Bitcoin's a mining blockchain, it runs proof of work. And so the computers that, you know, run that network are paid two ways. They're paid by the fees. So whenever you send Bitcoin around, you know, you're paying a transaction fee. So part of that goes to miners. And then, you know, new Bitcoins also created by the blockchain itself to pay those. That's called the block reward. And every, every four years, that block reward gets cut in half, which means there's half as much Bitcoin 
on the market every four years. And you know, people kind of turn this into a superstition that controls the entire crypto markets. But regardless of what you think of that, you know, that is going to have some impact on the price of Bitcoin, assuming that the demand is steady over time. Now, ETH is actually about to undergo something called the triple halving, okay, uh, plays off of Bitcoin's halving with the Ethereum 2.0 merge. So ETH also implemented a network upgrade in the past year or so called EIP 1559 that causes ETH to be burnt whenever new transactions are sent. So if, if let's just say that I send ETH from my account to yours, you know, that's a transaction, or if I trade a token on Uniswap, that's a transaction. And whenever I send that transaction, it's getting split up into two parts, the base fee and the minor tip. And the base fees actually just gets erased from the network. And so every time this happens, you know, every time somebody makes a transaction, then ETH just gets burnt. Now, you have to understand that new ETH is also getting created by the blockchain. And so right now, with the amount of network activity and the amount of ETH that's getting created by the blockchain... There's still a positive ETH issuance on an annualized basis. So we're creating new ETH by the blockchain. We're burning ETH, but there's more ETH created than there is ETH burned. So all it's doing right now is slowing down the issuance of new ETH. Uh, so ETH is still, you know, positive issuance or inflationary in this case. So after the ETH 2.0 merge happens, though, ETH is going to undergo the triple halving, just like Bitcoin's halving, but three times all in one go. So just like three years of Bitcoin halvings all in one moment. So... Let's look and see what happens here. If you go to this website like Ultrasound Money, this illustrates this. You know, here's the amount of ETH issued on an annual basis. Right now, 5.5 million Ether per year. This is right now before the Ethereum 2.0 merge. And you can see we're burning, you know, 1 million ETH per year. This is, illustrates that offset that I was talking about here. There's, there's 5.5 ETH per year being created, 1 million getting burnt. But if you simulate the merge, you can see that this amount's going to go down an insane amount. So it went from 5.5 million to 0.6 million. That's what the triple having is. After the merge, we're going to reduce the amount of new ETH hitting the blockchain. We're going to cut it in half three times. So it's going from about 4% issuance per year, 4% down to 2%, 2% down to 1%, 1% down to 0.5%. That gets half three times, hence the triple having, which is an exponential decrease in the amount of ETH hitting the blockchain. And whenever this happens, you can see the issuance here is going to go to 0.6 million per year. And right now, the current network activity extrapolated from past one day's data, that's 1 million ETH burn per year, which is a minus 4% issuance. And if you scale that out on any time frame, five minute, one hour, one day, seven day, 30 day, all they all yield a negative number. And so no matter how you slice it, like assuming that the demand for ETH the asset itself, you know, stays at least the same that it is now, which I of course expect to grow it over time. And the network demand stays at least the same as it is now. And of course, I also expect to grow over time then this is going to have an impact on the price of ETH itself, mathematically proven by the blockchain. All right, so that's a big reason that the merge is going to have an impact on the price of Ether over time from the supply side of things, okay? So again, cryptocurrency prices are a function of supply and demand, so you have to have both in order to see price appreciate over time. But let's talk about the demand side of things. So one thing that's going to change about the ETH2 merge is that it's going to give people more reason to actually hold Ether the asset itself. And I think this is probably going to translate specifically to bigger players holding lots of ETH. So let's dig into that. So, you know, again, there's lots of reasons why you might want to hold ETH in the first place. It's one of the reasons I'm so big and bullish on the asset over the long term because you can use it to pay transaction fees. You can use it in DeFi. But one of the biggest things that's going to change about the Ethereum 2.0 merge is actually staking ETH on the network itself. And so, you know, after we switch, you are moving from mining proof of work to proof of stake. And now you can take your ETH and run a validator because miners are getting replaced by validators and you can lock it up into the network and earn yield on it. So that's another huge reason why you want to hold ETH in the first place, because the staking rewards can actually be quite high and ETH itself could become a pretty blue chip staking asset, maybe even the best staking asset on the market. And that's going to be a huge reason why people, especially big players, will want to hold lots of ETH. So let's let's go over those reasons right now. So reason number one is that, you know, big players especially want to hold a yield bearing asset where they expect their principle to appreciate over time as well. You know, it's pretty cool. You can get all these staking coins in crypto where you can buy them and they earn, you know, crazy yield. But what does that really matter if the price of the coin that you're holding just goes down over time? Okay, like, and you don't really care about the yield that you're getting if you don't actually get some a principal appreciation as well. It's just like anything else, like you wouldn't buy a rental property if you're going to invest in real estate, if you thought the value of the property was going to go down 
like a crazy amount and that you were still cash flowing over time. You wouldn't care about the cash flow if the property value was tanking. So the same reason, if you're going to hold something to stake, you want to hold a coin that you expect to appreciate in value over time. And ETH has one of the best shots at that after out of all the major staking coins out there for lots of reasons. So you have to understand that like the, the staking on ETH 2.0 is actually staking at the, at the blockchain level. So you have to run a validator in order to stake natively. We're not talking about taking like some sort of token and locking up into some app where there's all kinds of risk. There's probably the least amount of risk for the price of your asset to just go to zero if you're staking on the Ethereum network. So that's going to be a huge check mark, especially for big players who want to jump into this. Because the last thing somebody wants is their, their principal to go to zero. The second thing is there's lots of reasons why that asset is going to appreciate over time. The adoption for the Ethereum network is huge. It's on a long-term uptrend. We see demand for the technology headed in that direction. ETH has the largest developer ecosystem, all that type of stuff. And it also has a strong history behind it, which is huge. So there's lots of reasons to think why the ETH asset itself is going to appreciate over time. But now let's actually talk about the yield. So once, once you've like talking about an asset that's probably going to appreciate in price over time, you want to hold that. Then you want to get this bonus yield that's going to get unlocked on top of that with the ETH 2.0 merge with staking. So the yields actually be quite attractive. And so let me tell you why. So if you look at a website like Ethereum.org, they talk about the staking yields. So currently you can get 4.2% for staking your ETH natively on the network. Now you might say, oh, 4.2%, who cares? But that's not actually the final return. So I'll explain that here in a minute. But uh, I do expect this number to actually probably go up and down some over time. So it may even drop below 4.2%. So I'll explain that. Basically, uh, Ethereum has an incentive mechanism inside of it to secure the network. So you know, if not enough people are staking, they're going to give this insanely high APR or APY in order to attract more people on the network to run validators to help secure the network. And as more people do it, it's going to drop off over time. And of course, some of those will shut their machines down. But then when that happens, you know, the APR is going to go back up for everybody else who's actually sticking it out. And so you have to think about this number 4.2%. It might even go down a little bit. Let's say it goes into 4%. But you have to add other things on top of this. So that's going to add to the yield. So let me explain that. There's two other things. The first thing is transaction fees. So remember earlier I was talking about how whenever you're sending transactions around, you pay a fee to do that. Like if I send ETH from my account to yours, all right, I got to pay a fee plus the transaction amount that I'm sending. So um, on Ethereum 2.0, of course, part of that's going to get burnt and erased from the network, but part of it's also going to go to the actual validators themselves or the stakers in this case. You have to get all the network activity, all the fees are getting paid to the blockchain itself and then divide that among all the stakers on the network and then add that to the APR. So, you know, you can very easily start to double this APR if the network activity goes up. Now, I don't have the exact math for how it's going to work off the top of my head. I've seen lots of different models floating around trying to forecast this, but truly we won't know until the network upgrade actually goes live. And then we actually empirically measure how much people are earning from their validators. But the whole idea here is that this is just a starting point and that you are going to get more rewards on top of this APR from the transaction fees. So the other thing is from minor extractable value that's gonna add to these fees as well. So well, what is that? Well, y- you might have seen like different strategies for you know things like cryptocurrency arbitrage uh, between two decentralized exchanges, or maybe some sort of way for somebody to you know create some sort of profit kind of out of thin air on the blockchain. That's really what minor extractable value is. And right now on the blockchain, basically the mi- in many cases the miners are the ones who are able to just you know change instructions to, to extract that profit for themselves. Uh, when we have answers like Flashbots coming out to this to create like private mempools to combat MEV. But on Ethereum 2.0, you can actually run MEV boost with your own validator and start to, you know, get minor extractable value for yourself. Okay. And of course, that's going to, you know, change with how Ethereum does a 2.0, you know, staking model. And I don't have the exact math on how that's going to boost the staking yields either. But the whole point is, you know, this You have this APR plus the transaction fees plus MEV boost, and that's going to create another income stream for validators, which is going to be another reason why, especially big players want to hold ETH so they can take advantage of that big yield. Okay, and so that's why, you know, there's going to be huge demand pressure, in my opinion, for ETH the asset itself post-merge, especially from, from some of the big dogs. So, you know, again, cryptocurrency prices are about supply and it's about demand. You know, supply is going to change with the ETH 2.0 merge and the demand side of things is also going to change most likely because of this new ability to earn yield on ETH, the asset itself. So that's one. That's the big reason why I think that ETH is going to appreciate in price uh, significantly over time post-merge. Again, there could be a short-term trade associated with the merge uh, that could impact the price of ETH. We could see it dump, you know, shortly after from by the room, Michelle and News. But mathematically speaking, I do expect this to have a pretty big impact on the price of ETH over the long term, which is what I'm most interested in. 
Now, I want to talk about some of the most common misconceptions from the merge, um, because this is going to impact people who are trading the merge, in my opinion, because a lot of people are looking for a buy the rumor, sell the news situation, and specifically, they're waiting for all the ETH that's locked up into the beacon chain right now that's going to flood the market right after ETH 2.0 uh, merges, and then it's going to cause the price of ETH to just completely dump, okay? So this is actually a pretty big misconception. So what they're thinking is, basically, right now, we have this separate blockchain running over here, the ETH 2.0 beacon chain, and you see on this website here, you know, we have like 4,000, sorry, 400,000 validators running, Okay. So they're running on the beacon chain. They're not actually running on Ethereum 2.0. So it's the separate blockchain. You can send Ether to it so you can start staking it now. Uh, but it's not going to actually, like you can't actually use that blockchain other than just for staking purposes and producing those blocks until the merge happens. Now, also, once you send your ETH to the beacon chain, you can't get it back till after the merge, okay? The merge has to happen, then the funds will be liquid. But that's where a lot of people get this wrong. They think like on the date of the merge, everybody who sent their ETH and locked it up for a year plus is now just going to like take it, take the money and run and then dump it and, you know, sell it for cash. That's going to put all this, you know, sell pressure on ETH and cause the price to tank. So what a lot of people don't understand is there's actually going to be a post-merge cleanup period. So they're not going to be able to withdraw their funds instantly after the merge. There's uh, a period of probably of at least a month, maybe longer, where they have to finalize everything with the merge before they unlock that ETH and can hit the market. So, you know, it's not just going to instantly become liquid for, you know, selling to fiat currency. So another big question I have all the time is like, is this going to affect the gas fees for ETH? Is, is this merge going to fix everything? It's not going to do that, but that's okay. You don't have to wait for the merge to happen to fix that problem now. The long-term vision is to use layer two scaling solutions, which a lot of those are live right now. We have a lot more coming online very soon. And the other question is, is this going to, you know, make ETH faster? So the, the merge in and of itself is not going to make ETH faster. Um, I'm going to caveat that it, it can it can make block times a little more predictable and some of those predictable block times might be slower than some of the longer uh, variable block times on ETH right now, but it's not going to noticeably make ETH faster or cheaper to use. But again, that's those layer two scaling solutions are for. All right, so that's all I got for today. As always, smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. That really helps these videos out so the more people learn about my blockchain. And if you're as fast as the technology as I am, you want to get your hands dirty, how you can get started today. When you go to my YouTube homepage, you can find my free courses there. They're like Udemy courses, but they're totally free. And if you like those and you want to take the next step or hey, maybe you want to take a master shortcut entirely, I can show master blockchain step by step start to finish over at dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp. You have to be an expert to get started today. I've helped people with zero coding experience become real world blockchain developers in a matter of months. So that's all I've got. Until next time, thanks for watching Dapp University.